All right, next, we have some familiar names here. Uh, uh, Mia Bridges, KQ4, Mike Golf Z uh, from the College of William and Mary, and the NRAO Ham Radio Project. Huh. Interesting. All right, well, they're going to come up and talk to us about operating the GBO's 20 meter radio telescope with ham with the ham radio students. Take it away. Okay, uh, we're here to tell you about operating the Green Bank Observatory's 20 meter radio telescope with ham radio students. I'm Xander. Uh, I'm Mia Bridges. I'm a junior at the College of William and Mary. Um, our other presenters, uh, Aaliyah could not make it and Danielle is in the audience. Hello. Um, and yeah. Uh, we are ham radio students through a program at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO. This two-semester program has a goal of bringing diverse young adults into the amateur radio community by teaching them fundamentals about the electromagnetic spectrum through the lens of ham radio and helping them obtain technician and general class licenses. In the program, we cover topics such as these. <laughs> I can't even read them from here. Oh, there's a small screen right here. Wow. Um, so, uh, wave characteristic, wave propagation, uh, amateur radio op uh, operating components, and careers in uh, or ca careers related to the EMS, and just broader electronics in general. Um, next slide, think. Uh, as part of the NRAO ham radio program, students got to participate in a visit to the Green Bank Observatory, where we had tours of the ham radio telescopes, electronics labs, and we got to practice soldering techniques. I burned my fingers. Um, and we were trained to operate the 20 meter radio uh, telescope by staff scientists. All right, so um, the program that we use to operate the 20 meter telescope is called Skynet, um, Skynet Robotic Telescope Network. It is a um, computer program website that allows uh, remote digital access to over 17 telescopes across the globe. Um, but the GBO 20 meter is the only radio telescope that it has, the rest of them are optical. Um, the, we're going to talk in a minute about how we observe pulsars using the 20 meter, but um, that's not, I want you to know that that's not the only thing that um, the 20 meter can do. Um, you can use it to look at various different celestial objects in the sky, um, a bunch of different parameters to optimize to be able to look at um, objects of different sizes, um, but we are going to give you the uh, rundown on the optim parameters that we optimized um, to look at some pulsars in a minute. Next slide. Uh, all right, and so here, if I can get it to play, um, is a screen recording that we have of the Skynet interface. Um, so you see on the left, that's just a star map that they have. Um, you need to start by finding the um, object that you want to have. So uh, you saw at the top, there was a box where you can put, put keywords in. Um, Skynet has a database of some objects in it already that um, it has coordinates in it already. Um, so if you are looking for something more like well known, you can just search it in right there. If not, um, you had to manually put in the coordinates yourself like, in, like you can see me doing right there. Um, you have to add a name to it. Um, and then the two boxes next to it, you can see the minimum sun separation and target elevation. Um, that's just the degrees of distance from the sun and from the horizon that um, you want your target to be at all times. Those are 10 degrees and 20 degrees are the um, recommended parameters for those. Um, and then down at the bottom, there is a schedule of um, when the object that you're um, targeting is going to be in view of the telescope um, in the next 24 hours. Um, right now you see the uh, resolution modes. Um, so with, there's two options. There's the high and low resolution modes that um, basically say what frequencies that um, it's going to be looking at. We ended up using the low resolution mode, which is the optimized one for pulsars. And uh, you see that checkbox right there. That's just pulsar mode. You hit that if you're going to look at some pulsars. Um, finally here, you can see there's that box in the middle that says track. That's a um, list of the different observation modes. Track is just the one that follows the object across the sky, but there's a couple of different ones that you can use. Um, and there you can see the integration observation times, which we'll be talking about in a second. Um, and finally, at the end of it, it gives you a um, just review of all the parameters that you've put in to make sure they're correct. Um, and yeah, that's the basics of how to use um, Skynet. Okay, uh, in our project, we chose to focus on observing pulsars. What are pulsars? 
Pulsars are formed at the end of a massive star's life cycle when it collapses into a really small and dense star known as a neutron star. However, as it collapses, it gains rotational momentum that generates strong magnetic fields that direct electromagnetic radiation beams out from two poles as seen in yellow on the diagram. The neutron star is at the center of this diagram, and the magnetic field lines are, the surrounding, it, are surrounding it in blue. The star's rotational axis is the vertical red line. When viewing this type of neutron star from Earth, we observe the radiation beams as regular pulses of light in the radio spectrum at regular intervals ranging from milliseconds to seconds. We decided to observe four well-known and studied pulsars for our project. The PSR and numbers are the official catalogued names of these pulsars, but they also have fun names and noteworthy details. The first pulsar was the first one ever discovered and is nicknamed Little Green Man. The second pulsar is the first discovered millisecond pulsar. The third pulsar is at the center of the Crab Nebula, which is a region of diffuse gas shown in the image on the lower right. And our last pulsar is known as Lich, and it is a unique system where astronomers have detected an exoplanet orbiting the pulsar. When submitting details through Skynet for our observation, there were many parameters to decide as Mio was showing earlier in the video. Since we observed pulsars, uh, since, since we observed pulsars, there are some parameters that need to have fixed values to optimize the pulsar data collected. These parameters are listed in the purple column, and the specific values are used in the middle column. The only parameter that changed was the first one. Uh, RA and uh, declination, because this is the, is the position on the sky for each target, so those values would only change when uh, we were observing a different pulsar. For other parameters, there are multiple options for values to use, and these can be tweaked depending on the target object or science questions we're asking. These parameters are in the purple column, and we decided to test three options as per parameter that roughly represent the three extremes, minimum, default, and maximum. By observing each target multiple times and only varying one parameter at a time, we tried to gain an understanding of each parameter's impact on our data. All right, so the first parameter that we looked at varying was the integration time, which is basically the um, length of time that the telescope takes, sort of a snapshot of the uh, observation target. Um, so within the observation time, the total length that the telescope is observing it, it'll take so many snapshots and those will get stacked on top of each other essentially to create the final um, observational image. Um, and essentially what we found by varying the, the integration time is that um, a longer integration time will allow us to see more pulses with the pulsar. Um, we have here some of the phase profiles from uh, Litch, the um, one with the exoplanet. Um, so you see on the far side, that one, we had the input, the shortest integration time of 0.001 seconds, 0001 seconds, sorry. Um, and it's, you see essentially all that we're getting is um, noise. You don't see any defined pulses there. Um, in the center, you see a integration time that we've input of 0 0.0062 seconds, which is the period of the pulsar that we were looking at. And you can see the two um, defined pulses there. And then this one, we had a integration of 0.3 seconds, which was the like default um, integration time that you'll see when you go into Skynet. Um, and you can see we got a lot more pulses there. Um, so generally we found that the longer the integration time was, the more pulses we got to look at. Um, secondly, we looked at the varying the observational time, which is the, the total amount of time that the telescope was looking at the pulsar. Um, and generally we found that um, with a longer observation time, we would get less, um, less RFI and less noise. Um, so you can see here on these uh, right-hand um, parts, pairs of the graph, um, the lighter the graph is, the less noise that we're observing. Um, so on that far left side, we had an observation, the shortest observation time of 60 seconds. And you can see that that um, phase frequency diagram is very dark. Um, then the second, we observed it for 120 seconds, slightly longer, and it's a little bit less dark, kind of a medium uh, tone. And then on this side, we had the longest observation time of 300 seconds. And apart from where the pulses are specifically, um, you see that the rest of it is very light. So we don't get a whole lot of... Um, of noise and RFI um, when the when we observe for longer. And you can also see that in the um, pulse profiles here, um, the smoother the curve is, um, the less noise interference we were getting. Um, and the final thing that we varied was the filter, which is basically just um, what it sounds like. It's uh, the different frequency bands that um, the telescope will look at. Um, you see on the far left side, um, that is the, we didn't have a like blocking filter on it. That's the all the um, 
frequencies that it was observing. You see that white spot in the middle um, because that filter is constantly on the um, radio observations with the GBO to block out just a source of noise that they um, haven't been able to get, it, to get rid of. Um, then in the center one, we have the uh, H1 filter. And then on the uh, this side, we have the OH2 filter. And uh, you see it just blocks out part of the um, observation. But you can still see the pulses in um, each of the observations are in here and there. So uh, generally we found that um, what caused the greatest uh, changes and variation to our observations was the integration time, which allowed us to see more or fewer pulses. Um, and then after that, the observation time, which decreased the amount of noise the longer we did it. Um, and then finally the filter, which just changed the um, frequencies that we were observing. But uh, if you have more questions on it, you should come see our poster tomorrow at 2 p.m. In addition to the observing project experience, all students in the NRA, NRA ham radio program will have gained uh, the following benefits. We have tech licenses. We are working towards our general class licenses. We are far more knowledgeable when it comes to the electromagnetic spectrum. We have gotten uh, on-air experience. We've gotten some really awesome hands-on building experience. Some of us got to visit the GBO, which was incredible. Uh, and we get to be here, which is really fun. Um, <laughs> And lastly, uh, the next group uh, is our friends who are going to be telling you all about how awesome uh, this was. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, no, no questions. <laughs>